Well, good evening, everybody. How y'all doing? It's Gary, the guy in the pink shirt. Good to, <clears throat> I guess, virtually not see everybody. Not sure what the greeting is. Uh, Tom Turner is our special guest tonight. If you don't know my friend Tom Turner, there he is, looking happy and cheerful because he's flying a bonanza. Uh, you don't know about Thomas P. Turner, the wonderful guy. He's actually very impressive, uh, at least on paper, but again, then so am I. <laughs> <laughs> there you I hear him laughing in the background. Yeah. He was actually yeah. inducted to the Flight Instructor Hall of Fame in 2015. Uh, I know he's been the uh, Flight Instructor of the Year on a regional level a couple of times. He's got a Master of Science degree in Aviation Safety, which always impresses me. And he's the Executive Director of the Air Safety Foundation for the American Bonanza Society. <clears throat> and he's got a great website. Uh, if you've never been to it, mastery-flight-training.com. Welcome, Tom. How are you? Doing great, Gary. Thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. Absolutely. And it looks like we have just about 800 of our 1,700 registered friends on board. If uh, oh, Also, of course, you can always find Tom at Bonanza.org. If you haven't seen me live or on a webinar yet, yeah, I really do wear bright pink shirts. I'm the uh, 2019 FAA National Instructor of the Year. I'm a, a lead FAA safety team rep. And the only thing I'm good at, I promise, is I've spent two decades specializing in autopilots, Avidyne, Foreflight, and Garmin, using them in single pilot, real world IFR. So all I do is focus on those technologies for single pilot IFR. Could not spell the word Shondell. Every so often, somebody will say, well, you know, will you do my Bonanza or uh, my fair and check out or whatever. And I was actually scheduled to go do the uh, B triple P training program this week with Tom. And no, um, because even when I do my B triple P training program, I wouldn't be good at it because I don't specialize in one particular aircraft. I only specialize in single pilot IFR using buttons. And you can learn more about me at pilotsafety.org. Most important thing you all need to do is you must be part of the FA Wings program. It's free. It gets you out of trouble, sort of. I mean, everybody gets investigated by the FAA eventually. You, you bust somebody's airspace, you accidentally gear up an airplane, whatever. And the FAA really has no interest in suspending or revoking a pilot certificate. It's not a kinder, gentler FAA. They just have a policy um, where they want to make you better. It's called compliance. So every investigation starts out with, if you didn't do it on purpose and nobody got hurt, we just want to make you better. Well, if you're active in the WINGS program, you've already proven to them that you believe in that. And it really goes much, much easier. Another benefit of being active in the WINGS program, and tonight's program gives you credit for the WINGS program, is it applies towards the flight review. Another benefit is that if you insure with uh, many insurance companies, you get discounts, like a Vemco gives a big discount. Other insurance companies give different programs. And if you're not active, please, it's really, really simple. There's no downside to this. You just go to fasafety.gov and you click right there, create an account. And there's a lot of benefits to being part of the WINGS program if you're an instructor. Tom? Yeah, that's right. Uh, a lot of flight instructors don't know this, but it's contained in the advisory circular that describes the wing pro WINGS program. If you are a flight instructor, and in the previous two years, you have endorsed at least 15 WINGS events that involve at least five different pilots, and if you yourself currently have, uh, have uh, completed a level of FAA WINGS, then that combination satisfies the requirement for renewing your flight instructor certificate. You can take your, your wings record into your local FISDO and walk out with a renewed flight instructor certificate without having to take any 
uh, FERC course. Now, I'm a big fan of recurrent training myself, and I, I, I get a lot out of the FERC courses. But if you do a lot of uh, WINGS endorsements, you can uh, renew your flight instructor certificate without having to uh, go to uh, all of that extra effort. That's great. And, you know, uh, as a master flight instructor myself, I actually don't do flight reviews. I only use the WINGS program because it covers so much more. I just think it protects me. You know, when you just sign like the one hour ground, one hour uh, flight flight review, there's just so much it's not doing. So uh, I'm with Tom on this one. All right, so now let's talk about the now over 800 people on board. This is what I know about the people who are live on the webinar or the people who are watching the recorded version later you're already good pilots and instructors. Why do I say that? Well, because because you're here, right? <clears throat> well, what does that mean? Well, you want to be better pilots and instructors. So my question to you is, well, why do you want to be better? You're already good. So everybody, if you will use the questions feature, let me know why you want to be better. You're already good. If you passed an FAA check ride, you're already a good pilot. But why do you want to be better? So please use the participation. Please use the question feature. And just give me some comments like, what's in it for you? Because there certainly had to be something good on TV tonight, right? <laughs> and Robert Dell for the win. Robert Dell, you get the prize because I don't want to die. Robert Dell for the win, absolutely. And you know, Mark Bennett says safe. John Albert says a great answer. He's a low time actual IFR, he's fresh off a check ride, right? Jason, always learning, never arrive. To be a safer pilot, a lot of people can always say that, right? Doug Parrish, stack the odds in my favor. I love that. I absolutely love that, right? Dan, Dan Stewart. Hey, Dan. Um, I have six kids I want to come home to every evening, right? So all of these are always great answers. And there's just they're just rolling in and they're all great. All right. Thank you. So I really do say this to people when I'm teaching at uh, on a national stage or on a national member like this. I really do think you're the best pilots in the country and in the world because not every pilot avails themselves of continuing education. So people sometimes ask, you know, why, Gary, why do you speak for free at every national show? And why do you put on all these webinars for free? Well, there was a guy named Harry Leicher. When I was a very young pilot, I got my private and something silly, like 44 hours. And I got my instrument rating and probably 44 or 45, which was not good for me. I was pretty much sure I knew everything and was an awesome pilot. And I went to a guy named Harry Leicher for my commercial who quickly fix that attitude. He would not sign me off for my commercial check ride because I was an idiot who thought I knew everything and I was wrong and he proved it. He wouldn't let me do anything until I could diagram every system on the plane, until I could explain why the emergency checklist sometimes were wrong and would make things worse and he forced me quite against my will to go to FA wings program. In other words, the man made me a pro. And I have an interesting GA accident rate goal. And a lot of people say I'm unrealistic, but I would like to reduce the GA fatality accident rate goal to zero. And a lot of people will tell me, well, zero is not realistic. Okay. So what I want to ask people is, well, okay, well, what's realistic? And people will say, well, only 100 people dying this year is realistic. And I say, not a problem. I just want you to pick out 100 of your friends who are pilots, go to their families and say, we need your family members to die this year because that's realistic. And that's horrible, right? Could you pick out 100 of your friends who are pilots and say, it's okay if you die this year, because if only a hundred pilots die this year, that's okay. Well, no, 
really the only thing that's okay is zero. It may not be realistic, but I think that should be our goal. So not reducing them, but eliminating them. And the only way we can do that is if everybody joins the pink army and y'all partner up. What can we accomplish together? Well, if y'all buy into the mastery, not minimum philosophy, right? You can never be just good because just being good only works when things are normal. General aviation accidents will go down. And <clears throat> now I will tell you that Tom is here to kind of counterbalance my crazy. I do and I will say some very controversial things. That's that's me. But sometimes when I say things, people react really strongly because what I say is contrary to what they know is to be true. So one of the things I'll just tell you now so everybody can get their freak out over with, I put my gear down and land uh, approach flaps five miles before the initial approach fix. I don't ever like putting gear down to track a glide path or at the final approach fix. I think it's dangerous. I have researched an awful lot of accidents. I think it causes gear up landings and I've got some stats that kind of back me up. But that's just an opinion. Well, I said this at a national uh, convention where I was invited to be a paid speaker and the head of the safety committee lost his little mind. He pulled me out afterwards and said, you can't teach that. If these are very high performance airplanes, if you drop the gear that early, you're gonna cause these airplanes to stall spin. I'm not sure. Hey, Tom, maybe you can chip in on me uh, with this. How exactly does putting the landing gear down early cause a plane to magically flip over into a stall spin? I, I can see some counter argument to extending the gear that far out, and actually we'll get into it in a little bit here, but I cannot see an inadvertent stall and spin entry being part of any argument against when you should extend your landing gear. Right, there's a lot of legitimate arguments to my opinions, but so why did he react so strongly? Because I violated something called primacy. So if you've been taught something and now you teach it and anybody says something different, it's an emotional reaction and it's frightening. So I just want everybody to kind of keep an open mind. And <clears throat> remember, this is absolutely me versus Tom tonight. I want everybody to vote <laughs> at the end. Who's the most rightest? Who's most wronger? It's the guy in the pink shirt versus the guy in the red jacket. Well, no, that's, that's not what this is about at all. Um, this is my admiration for Tom. We've been friends for years. I don't know if everybody knows this. Uh, he wrote the foreword to my book. Um, in fact, a lot of my research, I've been preaching PAC for years. A lot of my research originally started with this article on aviation safety, approach configuration management. And if you look real close, it was written by a guy named T. Turner, who <laughs> kind of sounds familiar. So a lot of things I do at pilotsafety.org were inspired by the AOPA Air Safety Foundation and honestly, Tom Turner at the ABS Air Safety Foundation. So although we will disagree a little bit on techniques, this is a friendly discussion and it's all about, I want you to take away what you think is best and form your own opinions. You may disagree with both of us and that works totally fine. So <laughs> have an audience oath for everybody. This is better at a live, uh, live event also, but everybody raise your right hand and say, I state your name again, funnier in a live audience will be an active participant in this program. So on your go to webinar control panel, and I can't tell you how to do it because I don't see your control panel. There's going to be a poll, and you'll know when the poll pops up. Please answer the poll. Use the question feature. When you want to interact, when you want to ask a question, go ahead and do that. Share this program with others. And there are two handouts. And again, I'm sorry, I can't tell you how to get to the handouts, but if you can't find them, we'll show you how to get to them at the end. 
there's a video or a, a picture where you'll be able to share this program on Facebook, Twitter, all the social media sites afterwards. And there's a handout with a bunch of resources and uh, more information about pack flying. You can download it now, but don't worry about it. You can just print it later. Okay. And this really only works if you all use the question feature and interact because it shouldn't be a program just by Tom and I, it should be done by all of you. Okay. So if you see something on the screen that you want to screenshot and share, go ahead. This is absolutely free domain. We want you to share it with everybody. So here's a great quote by Bill Ackman. Experience is making mistakes and learning from them. I just want you to know that I've made a lot of mistakes. I mean, I, I have a lot of experience. I, I really have specialized in IFR with technology for two decades. I got 8,300 hours of real world experience and I've made plenty of unstabilized approaches and go around, which got me interested in PAC. So I'm gonna kind of turn it over to Tom who will tell us a little bit about the history of PAC. Well, um, like a lot of things that um, we teach in aviation, some good, some maybe could be taught a little bit differently, but like a lot of things that we teach and learn in aviation, uh, the PAC philosophy really was an outgrowth of the short period, about two and a half years of very, very large scale pilot training in the United States during World War II. And the idea was primarily to standardize pilots in any given type of airplane to fly them the same way for a couple of reasons. One, uh, so that if it was a crewed airplane, if they had a co-pilot or, or were serving as co-pilot, they, they could anticipate what the other pilot was going to do. They all did it the same way. And two, probably far more importantly, simply to turn a bunch of 200 our total time pilots loose to the with the keys to a P-51 or B-17 and say, here, fly this thing across the Atlantic Ocean. And by the way, when you get there, they're going to start shooting at you. So uh, the, the PAC philosophy was simply that by using known quantities or, or known uh, values of power, pitch attitude of the aircraft and aircraft configuration, that is landing gear and flat position, the uh, airplane will behave in a very predictable uh, way. So let's let's move on. Next. There we go. Um, about 1990 or so, this became popularized in a book uh, by John Echelbar for the Beach Bonanza community, flying the Beach Bonanza. Uh, most of the aircraft type clubs in the high performance uh, uh, end of, of uh, light personal aviation use similar philosophies. Uh, and even in his book, uh, John acknowledges that he is, it's nothing that he created, but it's something that he is popularizing for pilots in a new generation. So next. Okay, and uh, I'm gonna sit thank Doug Parrish. Okay. Doug uh, actually helped us out. There's apparently a document icon on your control panel to download everything. And a lot of people are asking questions. I'll definitely come back to them. Let's define what PAC is for those of you who don't know. It's a pretty simple formula. If you set power to a set value and you put the plane in a specific attitude plus a specific configuration, like landing gear up, landing gear down, certain flaps, you will always get a very specific performance, okay? So that's called pack. So let's review just a couple accidents when people don't understand how to use pack. Well, February 8th of this year, a beach C-35, a pilot did not feel comfortable continuing an approach. He initiated a go around. That's always a good decision. In the interview, he said, I was going too slow and heard the stall warning horn. And that's what happened. 
because he wasn't using a stabilized pack setting. He wasn't using a stabilized approach, and he didn't do a stabilized skill round. Here's another one, just from, you know, within a year. November 11th, 2021, assessed a 172 N model. The student bounced on a landing, started to porpoise, initiated a go around. Again, always a good decision. Well, we got this one on video. And you, you can see the stall, right? So most instructors in general aviation limit pack. They just apply it to go arounds, missed approaches, traffic pattern. In other words, most instructors go power attitude configuration for anything in the low and slow world. And the American Bonanza Society has some great training materials. And I just pulled one little slide out for Tom to talk about, about uh, there are specific examples for an IFR missed approach. Right, um, this is one of the, this is really the basis of all we teach in the pack or sometimes called flying by the numbers philosophy. Uh, we base all of the packs that we use for the approach part of flight on what is required to make a smooth, trimmed, missed approach. So we'll talk about the rest of it later on, but as we're flying inbound on the approach, we fly the airplane in a configuration at a power setting and trimmed on a particular speed so that when we miss the approach and we apply power, the nose will naturally rise up to the proper attitude for the climb out speed. And then we clean up the airplane and we can accomplish the entire uh, on the gauges portion of an approach, including the missed approach with virtually no change in the trim setting and consequently almost hands off. Right, and, and it, the, it's the consistency that brings safety. So I'm gonna, throw in a couple questions here. And this first one's from Sean Torbett. Sean, thanks for joining us. Tom, how much performance or how much difference in performance for a given configuration have you seen when landing at sea level and one at a high altitude density altitude? I've seen substantially different performance. Um, I've flown many times at sea level. I live in Wichita, Kansas, which is about 1,500 feet above sea level. And in a Bonanza, I'm about two hours away from Colorado Springs, where I've departed with a density altitude in excess of 10,000 feet. The same um, power settings and configurations work at any density altitude. The attitude will need to be substantially lower at a high density altitude because even at full throttle, for instance, the airplane, the engine is developing less power and consequently uh, cannot climb at the same speed at the same attitude it would at a little over density altitude. So part of the transition to uh, flying at high density altitude is realizing that, for example, instead of pitching to about seven degrees nose up for a VY departure, you pitch to about five degrees nose up at those attitudes. You still fly the same indicated airspeeds, but it requires a lower pitch attitude. Another way of putting it uh, quickly here is that if you know the attitudes and configurations and power settings that work, and one of the major variables changes, 
you can ahead of time predict what you might need to do just a little bit differently to accommodate for those changes. Right, and uh, for those of you who don't know, I actually uh, have lived in the mountains. I lived in the mountains of Big Bear, and I actually still to this day teach a basic, very basic three-day mountain flying intro. I'm going to do that in two weeks. I'm going to take a gentleman in a Cirrus up to Aspen and Vale and Leadville and all that good stuff. So cool. parts of the pack change in the configuration. Uh, what new mountain flying pilots commonly do is by simple rote memory. Uh, when coming into land, they go mixture rich. Well, you definitely don't want to do that because when you apply power to go around, you'll actually flood the engine and, and kill it. Um, but mountain flying is a little bit different. We actually don't use density altitude. Uh, in all of your performance charts, we actually use pressure altitudes. So you do a Coles chart, uh, a very slight difference. But the performance definitely changes. And you, yeah, you, you need to change for that. So the performance you get changes, but the steps do not. And that actually leads me to the next question from Richard Campbell. Do you endorse the use of an AOA uh, indicator? And I'll answer this one first. I've never been a huge uh, advocate of the AOA indicator for most of the GA flying, the IFR stuff that I teach, not saying they're not great, um, but I have found that some people look at that and they don't do the consistent pack flying. I will tell you they're absolutely wonderful if you are also doing pack flying, especially in the mountains, but not to the point where people are doing that and then not doing the consistent uh, pack settings. Tom? Well, I fly an airplane that has an angle of attack indicator, so I've been able to experiment quite a bit with it. and. Uh, many of the members of ABS have been early adopters at various technologies. So there are a lot of those installations out there. There are a couple of uh, issues that I have with them. The first is that they are entirely dependent on a proper calibration. Uh, usually the calibration is done by the aircraft owner and it's a challenging process to get one calibrated correctly. Uh, this, the second issue is even once they are calculated, uh, the preference, the pressure differential type AOAs that uh, we can install under the NORSI program without going through the full certification process like you would have in, in a jet or something like that. The ones that we have available in most light airplanes uh, do not have the, the level of fidelity that you might think they would. You can, I, I remember when, um, when they first came out, one of our ABS members who is a an Air Force test pilot school instructor at the time installed one in his Bonanza, and he he wrote us an article about how he could vary the indicated airspeed by as much as seven knots without seeing any change in the indication on the AOA. So uh, they they you can't fly them like you could if you were landing in F-18 on a carrier somewhere. Now the the other side of that is that they are a great um, confirmation that the pack you are using that you think you should be using is in fact the correct one to use. I like to have it as a as a backup when I'm flying a, a short field landing at a true short field airstrip and I hadn't really thought about it before because I haven't flown this airplane with the AOA up to the mountains yet but uh, since we've had that installed but uh, yeah it would be a really good confirmation that what you thought was the proper way to fly the airplane at a high density altitude was in fact giving you an angle of attack that you uh, need. Right. So now this brings me to my kind of pet thing. I consistently see people make the same big, dangerous, missed approach mistake in IFR. So all I do is I teach a three-day IFR mastery program for pets that are already good, but want to be great when things go wrong. One of the uh, chief instructors for Southwest Airlines hires me. I get people with 40 hours before they even start their instrument writing hire me. But one of the biggest mistakes people 
I see make every single time when they go missed is somewhere 50 years ago, this idiot instructor invented this cram, climb, clean, and they shove the throttle prop and mixture forward. That is so dangerous because people don't realize y'all, your arms are connected. So what they do is they know at missed approach, either at a decision altitude or while crossing the missed approach point at MDA, that they got to go around as fast as they can. So they lean forward and shove that throttle prop and mixture forward. Well, the problem is, is that actually makes the plane go down because it causes you to lean forward and the left hand pushes the nose down at the same time. They always lean forward and they push nose down. I watched a 68,000 hour airline captain shove that nose down and go 75 feet below decision altitude right towards runway 13, or I'm sorry, uh, 17 right at Oklahoma City. And then they jerk that gear up as fast as they can. Well, great, except cycling the gear causes the airplane to go down a little bit more because of a momentary increase of drag. And now they're within about 50 feet of the runway and they slap those flaps up. Well, I teach in most airplanes to do the first 10 degrees of flaps or approach flaps. Well, at that flap setting, it produces more lift than drag. So you've shoved the nose down, you've increased drag by slapping the gear up, you've now reduced lift by slapping those flaps up, and that causes another sink. So cram, climb, clean, in my opinion, just equals a crash. So what I tell everybody is, and here's the first or second controversial statement, is you don't have to shove the throttle forward first. I know it's crazy. Let me ask you a question. If you're flying in an airplane doing 110 knots and you just pull the nose gently up towards seven degrees, will the plane go up or down? Well, we got to tell you at 110 knots, it's probably going to go up, right? Initially. So, Yeah, I hope. Pull the nose up gently with the left hand, shift your weight to the right, push the throttle prop mixture with the right hand forward, confirm that you're climbing, then gear up. Now everybody goes, oh, you said you don't have to add power. No, it's almost simultaneous. I just want you to slow down just enough that you realize to shift your weight and you don't shove those throttles, props, and mixtures forward so fast that you shove the nose down at the same time. You can very gently pull the nose up, at least start pull the nose up as you shift and add power, and it's never going to cause a problem. But you confirm your climbing before you gear up. Because what happens if you shove everything forward and the engines stall or you're not climbing? You really do wish that gear was still down. Then you confirm you climb at 800 feet. At 800 feet, I recommend flaps up, then autopilot on in vertical speed or indicated airspeed and heading. Unsuspend the Garmin. Of course, the Avidine would have already done it. And then switch to NAV or GPSS. Why do I do everything at 800? Because many autopilots have a limitation of you can't turn them on until 800 feet anyway. It only takes a couple seconds to get there. And if you do the autopilot on and then bring the flaps up, the autopilots tend to porpoise a little bit. Tom, this is where I'm looking for that counter opinion of well, you don't have we, to shove that forward, throttle forward first. Well, um, we, we do have a different technique we teach. And again, that's it's the result of over 40 years of type specific instruction by hundreds of instructors. Uh, but it's not all as different as as it might sound. First, I don't like the idea of consciously establishing the pitch attitude first, because if you do that, you will 
change the angle of attack, you'll increase the angle of attack. You're still well above stall, but an airplane will attempt to seek the angle of attack for which it's trimmed. And if you pull the nose up, then it will want to nose down unless you change the trim. And it, you could get in a, uh, it, you could get distracted by the change of trim and not accomplish what you're trying to do. We teach it just a little differently, although it's doing about the same thing. Uh, first, we teach putting the propeller into the climb position prior to reaching the final approach fix and setting the mixture as appropriate for the field elevation before the final approach fix. And that way, you've essentially restored single power or established single, power, single lever power control. All you need to move is the throttle. You don't have to push everything forward like that. Now. Uh, again, the way we teach it is if you are flying at your missed approach airspeed, which happens to be 110 knots in most of the later Bonanzas, then the airplane is trim is very, very close to what it needs to be. So all you have to do is put the throttle to full power and the plane will naturally want to pitch up to about that seven degree pitch up attitude. So whereas you're saying move your left hand and then your right, we're saying move your right hand and then your left. But it's basically simultaneous as you said. From that point, very similar to what you do, uh, establish, you know, it's power, pitch, positive rate of climb. Then, you know, take a breath, make sure that you're established on the proper heading and in the climb attitude gear up then after the gear is up and you're still confirmed on the proper heading and attitude flaps up cow flaps open as necessary you know as appropriate to the airplane and at that point you will easily be at the uh, minimum altitude for engaging the autopilot as you said so uh, we're doing it a little differently for some different reasons but we're we're getting basically the same result by doing the same thing in a slightly different order Right. And, you know, I think we're both saying, and, and I want to emphasize to everyone listening, we're doing the nose and the power essentially yeah. at the same time. Yeah. Really the, difference nice. is that, the, the difference is the way I would do it. The power takes care of the nose for you and you're setting the nose and then catching up with the power right behind that. Really? more than, yeah, Absolutely. More than anything, when I say nose shift your weight push it's mm -hmm. not that i really want the nose up first i just want people to do everything much slower that's so the that key they don't point. shove everything forward that's the key that's right? the key that's the hey, key so hey, yeah absolutely so a uh, couple quick questions uh chris denny my airplane has a garmin takeoff go around button so uh, for those of you who don't know, if you have a Garmin GTN and a Garmin indicator like a G5 or GI275 or a G5600 display and a Garmin flight control, you can actually do a coupled go around. So when you hit the go around button, it actually puts the nose automatically in, it puts the autopilot into roll mode, wings level, nose up seven degrees. So essentially it's doing it kind of my way it's putting the nose up as you add power but it's all simultaneous it's right. it's put the nose up it's putting the nose up first as you add power it really wouldn't matter but yes it's the same way and yeah. uh just a couple yeah. other quick ones go ahead Tom. okay i was just going to say think about it this way uh if you were to establish the pitch attitude and noticeably wait before adding power you'd have problems that would be it, really dangerous that would be dangerous would be if you were to apply takeoff or go around power but maintain the constant pitch attitude for a few seconds all you would be doing would be driving at full throttle toward the ground at a three degree glide slope so it really is a matter of doing them both at the same time yeah absolutely um and Colin Smith uh, just says, uh, you know, 1A2, if you slap the flaps up first, yeah, you absolutely, you do sink. Uh, okay, oh, yeah. good. 
Yeah. Uh, all right. So the thing about PAC, though, is we can apply it to all phases of flight, not just the missed approach or the go around. I want people to use PAC and climb, cruise, descent, and especially on instrument approaches. And I'm going to turn this part over to Tom, and he's going to walk you through the way uh, the Bonanza Society does instrument approaches. And then I'm going to be back with my slightly different technique. Okay, great. Uh, we do use them again, uh, we use consistent settings of uh, power, attitude, and configuration for approaches. And again, the entire process is based on having the airplane trimmed for the missed approach procedure so that you have the lowest possible workload at this very high workload part of time. Now, before we ever get inbound on the approach, when we're in the terminal environment, uh, I like to enter what I call a vector configuration. And I'll do in an A36 Bonanza about 20 inches of manifold pressure. Or I can leave the RPM where it was in cruise. I, I, I can even leave the mixture where it was in cruise if I wanted at this point. Uh, the attitude is about level to maintain level flight. And with the gear up, uh, I may put the flaps into a partial position. We have uh, many of the later beach airplanes have a uh, an approach position that is 12 to 15 degrees uh, flaps, depending on the model, or you can leave them up. But the whole idea of this uh, vectoring configuration is to start the process of, of slowing the airplane down and getting ready for the approach. Uh, we aren't in the full uh, approach pack yet, but it's, it's uh, getting yourself in the mindset and getting the airplane slowed down a little bit as you're on vectors for intercept or toward that first initial approach fix. Next, once we intercept or we're about to intercept the final approach course uh, or in you know old school VOR and even NDB or whatever we approach as we would do this before we cross the initial approach fix on a, uh, on a GPS that's laid out in the standard T formation. I usually wait until I'm uh, on the T and about ready to turn inbound. But in any event, we aim in these particular airplanes, it works out well to use about 18 inches of manifold pressure. Uh, we'll go ahead and bring the RPM up to, in these planes, 2,500 RPM, which is the climb position. And I like to get the mixture on the rich side of peak, working it toward where it will be uh, at the appropriate position for the field elevation. So we're setting the power. Uh, it takes in level flight at this speed, which it will slow down to about 110 knots. It takes about a two degree up pitch attitude, depending on how the airplane center of gravity is located. The landing gear is up. And again, I like to use approach flaps in those airplanes with the pre-select. If it doesn't, I'll do it flaps up and it might take a little less manifold pressure. But what we're doing here is establishing a pack that results in 110 knots uh, indicated airspeed and level flight. And we trim for that. Why is that so critical? Because this is the, the optimal speed for climbing out in the missed approach procedure. And we'll proceed next inbound. All right, I already talked about, we're coming in on intercept, it's slowing down to 110 knots. And we can go next to the next slide. All right, now we're, Coming up on the final approach fix, we're in this configuration, we're ready to go. What we're going to do using our technique, and Gary and I might talk about this later, is that we will extend the landing gear when the glide slope centers or repass the final approach fix, whichever is appropriate to the approach. Now, the way that we teach it, and the reason we've been teaching this, is precisely to avoid the potential for forgetting the landing gear. Uh, our philosophy is that if you set the landing, if you extended the landing gear farther out, then the process of the, to, uh, to begin the descent down glide slope, you'll have to make a manifold pressure reduction. If you get distracted and you forgot to extend the landing gear, when you get to the final approach fix, you'll still make a manifold pressure reduction and you might have to pull it back a little farther to make it go down. But it reinforces an earlier distraction to forget the landing gear. So we, we do what we call gear down to go down. The airplane, simply using this philosophy, the airplane will not descend until you put the landing gear out. So we're getting ready to get to that point. We're inbound on the approach at 110 knots. Next. 
At the glide slope intercept, we extend the landing gear. The additional drag of the landing gear will cause the airplane to pitch down in these airplanes about two to three below the degrees below the horizon. And this will cause it to, at the same uh, manifold pressure setting, uh, the airplane will descend at the same trimmed airspeed. In other words, the drag of the landing gear gives you between five and 600 foot per minute rate of descent. If your ground speed is 90 knots, it takes roughly 500 foot per minute rate of descent to describe a three degree glide slope. If your ground speed is 120 knots, it takes about 600 foot per minute. So this technique in these airplanes, and it works pretty well in a Mooney, I don't have a lot of experience in other retractable gear airplanes, uh, but uh, this technique causes the airplane to get very close to the optimal rate of descent to maintain glide path. And again, if you forget to put the landing gear down, you'll just fly level on down and, and try to figure out what the discrepancy is and then note, oh, I forgot the landing gear. So it reinforces the landing gear check. Next. As you descend down the glide path, if you have a turbocharged airplane, everything's copacetic, just keep it going and fly down the glide path, making small adjustments as necessary. If you have a normally aspirated airplane, the manifold pressure will increase at the rate of about one inch for every 1,000 feet of altitude that you descend. And usually there's about 1,500 feet of altitude difference between the altitude where you intercept the glide slope and the airport itself. So you'll gain about an inch and a half of manifold pressure on the way down. If you don't do anything about that, then the uh, as power increases it during your descent, the rate of descent will decrease and you'll find yourself consistently high on glide slope. So what we teach is you don't have to be, you know, anal about the whole thing, maybe about one time, Halfway down, glide, halfway down the glide slope, look over there briefly and adjust your manifold pressure to get it back at its target value so that you maintain your pack and the airplane flies as you want it to. Next. And again, this puts you perfectly in position to fly the missed approach procedure. If you don't see the runway environment at the missed approach point, you apply power. The nose comes up to the optimal attitude. The airspeed remains constant. You uh, confirm a positive rate of climb. You retract the gear and you retract the flaps. You do it all in a, in a series of smooth and well-paced actions. Nothing fast, no cramming involved, just a smooth power application as the nose comes up and you climb out. That's it. Great, perfect, thanks, Tom. All right, so uh, now we're going to do it my way, and it's very yeah. similar. We have one key difference. So this is a Cessna T210, and I teach in Bonanzas and Marins all the time too, but this just happens to be one I pulled out of my files. Five miles before the initial approach fix, or when they say fly this heading for vectors, I always insist that the gear is down, locked, and green, and 10 degrees flaps. Why do I put the gear down five miles before the initial? Way, way out there. Well, two reasons. I geared up an airplane once and I never want it to happen again. And a lot of people have geared up by dropping it at or near the final approach fix and glide path because they'll drop the gear and they fixate on the localizer glide slope and they don't notice that the gear's not down and locked because that's the busiest time of the approach. So if the gear hangs, they'll still get the drag, but it might not be all the way down. So I like doing things early. I also like in a Cessna 210, 10 degrees flaps, because that's the short field takeoff setting. So I always put my configuration for an airplane. What would you be if you were doing a short field takeoff? So in any airplane, the gear is down and locked and typically the first notch of flaps in a Cessna. So that's what I do. So I want it done early because I guarantee my gear's down. And more important, see if you're actually in the clouds, it's always a little bit turbulent. The gear down, A, it slows you down, gives you more time to do the approach. It reduces decision fatigue and how fast decisions are made and it stabilizes the aircraft. 
Now in a turbo 210, you're gonna need more power. You're gonna burn some more gas on this approach. You're gonna need 29 to 30 inches and 2,500 RPM. And this should give you about the exact same thing, 110 knots. Tom and I pretty much right on the same speed. So y'all get to sit, uh, see Thern. Now, let me ask you a question. This is one of the things that drives me nuts. GTNs have this wonderful new feature called VNAV. You must, in my opinion only, immediately when you activate a procedure, press home utilities VNAV and turn it off. Because VNAV is great, but not during an instrument approach. VNAV sees outside of monkey that you're supposed to be at 2000. Do you have to go down to 2000 after you pass Seathern? No, and it's dangerous. Listen, you're over 10 miles from the airport. You never have to make that step down. You don't have to be at 2000. You have to be at or above 2000. You're much, much safer if you just stay at 3000. Hey, a little bit more glide range is better than nothing and wait for the glide path to come to you. So if you're a GTN user, I love VNAV. I love the new GTN VNAV feature. Avidine just added it. I love VNAV, just not on instrument approaches. Home utilities, VNAV disabled. It's part of our GTN training videos. So I don't want you to go down. I just want you to stay at 3000. Now I do it slightly different. When you intercept the glide path, instead of dropping the gear, I do a power reduction. So 22 inches will give you about 600 feet per minute, at 110 knots and you just cruise it right on down to the MDA, at which point you just bring power right back up to 2930. You don't even have to use an autopilot. It would automatically level you back off if you reset the power. You'll fly forward to the missed approach point, at which point, pretty simple. At the same time, you pitch seven degrees power prop mixture. Now, we had a lot of good questions. A lot of people are asking, well, if you add power, you don't need to pull the nose up. You're 100% correct. When I say pull the nose up to seven degrees, what I'm really doing, folks, is I'm just making sure that they don't shove the nose down by being overly aggressive by pushing that nose down, right? You really don't need to pull the nose up. You just don't want to overcorrect and shove your whole body forward, right? Absolutely. They've, if they're at this point, if they're trimmed and everything correct, and they go to maximum allowable takeoff power, sometimes it's full power, sometimes it's just max allowable, the plane will automatically go to seven degrees. They don't need to do anything, right? Confirm that they're climbing, then gear up at 800 feet, flaps up, autopilot on. So how do I pick the pack settings? Well, I typically use the short field takeoff flap settings, I need to be very conscious of the autopilot limitations, right? And I'm looking at the climb speeds for that airplane, VX, VY. So at this point, I want to run a poll. And if everybody you should see a poll now, if you can uh, answer the poll, and uh, we're going to go over a couple questions. So John, uh, how about the potential for confusion for those that fly both fixed and retract gear airplanes? That is a big problem. And that's why I actually use the same checklist on every plane, BCTF gumps. So if I'm training you in a Cessna 172N for an IFR mastery program, I make you use the undercarriage down and locked part of a checklist, even if you have fixed gear airplanes, because you won't always be, right? Um, the PO, this is from Lee and Tom, you can help me out with this one. The POH checklist states mixture as desired. How do I set the mixture uh, on approach? Well, I typically set it for what it would be on takeoff. Tom? Yeah, well, that's, as I said before, exactly the same way. Uh, set it as appropriate for takeoff from the airport at which you're arriving. Now this is, and maybe Gary coming back with your mountain experience, um, you might be able to help me out here too, but this is all, the question is always, I, I don't normally fly at a high elevation airport. 
I'm making my first landing at this airport. How do I know what the mixture should be set at for uh, approach if I don't if I've never taken off here before? Uh, how do you address that? Having you know teaching mountain flying. Well, well, that really just comes through experience and why I encourage people to never, ever fly in the mountains without a formal mountain flying course. And uh, mine is really just an intro. I mean, the best mountain flying courses in the world are uh, McCall Mountain Flying, uh, Judy up in Idaho. The Colorado Rocky Pilots Association has some great ones. Um, I have a very brief video. Uh, there's the Mountain Flying Bible is a very good book off Amazon, but it really just comes through uh, experience. Um, Frank, uh, and I typically, well, it really depends. You know, I, I can't give a good answer uh, on that, but it's really just through experience. Frank, Frank's got a, Frank Hale's got a great question. If you fly an airplane approved for flight in known icing conditions, putting the gear down that early could cause some major drag issues. Well, if you're in icing conditions, that changes everything. So like every one of my Gary, absolutely, this is always a rule. There are always exceptions, right? Always, always exceptions. Okay, so it looks like uh, we've gotten pretty good answers to the poll. And it looks like about 83% people have said uh, that ATC has asked them to maintain maximum forward speed. Well, this is what I think of high-speed approaches. Uh, no, I don't do them. Not in actual IMC. So if I'm flying a Turbo 210, a TBM, a 182, or a 172, it really doesn't matter what I'm training in. If ATC in actual IMC condition says, I need 60 knots or 40 knots faster than your normal approach speed, to the final approach fix, I say unable. This is an actual IMC. And when I say that at large public conventions, people go, but you have to at busy Bravo and Charlie airports. And you have to do it if ATC tells you to, because ATC instructions are mandatory. And I'm like, you sure about that? Because I thought there was something called 91 tree. And I wonder what the FAA specifically tells air traffic control about high-speed approaches. And I wonder what the FAA specifically tells pilots about approaches faster than their normal speeds. So 91 Tree says, if anything goes wrong, it's whose fault? Well, it's the pilot. So if you accept an ATC instruction to fly an approach in a Bonanza at 160 knots and you gear up the airplane or something goes wrong, that is your fault. That's, that's not ATCs. If anybody gets hurt, that, that, that's your fault. That's not ATCs. So what I've told people for, geez, 20 years now is one of the biggest differences I've noticed between a professional pilot and an amateur is a professional pilot says no to ATC a whole lot more. And we never just say no, we just say unable because, and this is what I can do. You don't just say no. Listen, if ATC says, hey, do this, and I don't want to because it's inconvenient, I accept the instruction and I do it. Hey, I don't want to read the reroute, but you're trying to space out aircraft, fine. It's inconvenient for me, don't care, you're doing your job. But if it's a safety issue, I'm gonna say that. But have you ever wondered what the FAA tells the air traffic controllers? Well, you may not know it. You might wanna Google these. These are called air traffic bulletin procedures. And this is what the FAA actually sends out to air traffic control facilities. And this is one from April of 2019. And it talks about stabilized approaches. And I've definitely summarized a whole lot of this. Aircraft speed and altitude play critical roles. It's very common at busy airports for air traffic control, ATC, to impose speed restrictions to maintain separation between aircraft while 
optimizing runway capacity. Clearances such as maintain 160 knots till six miles, we've all heard that, or maintain 170 knots until final are common. However, and this is a direct you know, guideline to ATC, assign speed restrictions that are reasonable. But here's the problem. Most air traffic controllers aren't pilots. There are some that are, absolutely. A few of the pilots that are controllers are instrument rated. A very small percentage of those are current and routinely fly enough to be proficient. So when an air traffic controller tells you in a 182, I need 140 knots, or in a TBM 850, I need 180 knots till final and maintain 6,000 until two miles out. They may not know that that's not reasonable because they're not familiar with every type of aircraft. So the FAA specifically reminds ATC there are four specific actions that the pilot is allowed to take. And the first one is absolutely refuse the clearance. Accepting a clearance for a maintain a high altitude or maintain a high speed approach is a judgment issue, is based on crew experience, aircraft capability, and the distance. You can request an early descent. Um, that would reduce the likelihood of trying to capture a glide slope from above. Requesting an early speed reduction. And this is why I dropped the gear early, because it builds in time to allow a checklist and briefing completion and enables early selection of the landing configuration. And they specifically address that early selection of the landing configuration. It puts aircraft into a power against drag configuration, facilitating achievement of the stabilized criteria. So that's straight from the FAA. But they also remind ATC that responsibility for achieving stabilized parameter res uh, rest with the flight crew. And ATC clearances and instructions, whether they are vectors, altitude constraints, or speed restrictions, can make the achievement of the stabilization criteria difficult or even impossible. They can assign you stuff that you just can't do, and it will become dangerous. So here's a high-speed approach. Now, a lot of people say high-speed approaches are safe if you are a very experienced pilot. If you have two pilots on board and you're Dave EMC, and I see lots of questions and comments coming in and I'll definitely get to them all. So let's look at one. This is in a jet. Uh, the pilot in command absolutely had a PIC type rating on the plane. He had over 2,500 hours with 90 as a PIC on this type. And there was a designated pilot examiner in the right seat for a simple check ride during day VMC. So no worries, right? So if he already had a PIC type rating, why was he doing a check ride? Because in the citation series, your initial PIC requires you to also have an SIC. So he was already PIC typed, but he was doing this to get what's called a single pilot exemption. So he could not take uh, a, a SIC. He'd already done engine out, he'd already done LPV, he'd already done ILS, he'd hand flowed some approaches and they were all done well. But the last approach the examiner had asked for was a high speed approach with the flaps up. They followed the checklist he deployed the gear at the final approach fix. Now, the FAA later interviewed the designated pilot examiner, and he said that the check ride to go from the PIC with SIC required to single pilot went well. This was their fourth landing. The last approach was a high speed approach with flaps up, but they felt a bump on landing that the examiner thought uh, that they had blown a tire. From the inspector report, both the pilot and the pilot in command and the examiner both specifically said they remembered adhering the checklist and actuating the gear 
on the approach. But the picture seems to say something different. Maybe the cockpit picture. Oh, well, uh-oh. Maybe when they were sliding down the runway and there was a fire underneath that damaged the bottom of the plane. So memory is a very tricky thing. So if anybody here has ever been in law enforcement, you will know that the eyewitness is never reliable. The human memory is never accurate because the brain fills stuff in with what it wants to fill in, right? So human memory is just not that great. I guarantee in their minds, they both remember deploying the gear, but clearly they didn't. So from a second interview with the pilot in command, they both went through the before landing checklist and he was sure he put the gear down. When he landed, he felt a thump. They both looked down at the gear handle and it turns out it was in the up position. And then he stated the gear horn did not go off because the examiner was having him perform a no flaps landing. Now, I'm gonna to bring Tom in on this. I will tell you, there are certain airplanes that the gear warning horn does not go off if the flaps are in the up position. It's true in certain Cessnas and in certain Piper models. Tom? Well, it's not true in beach airplanes. I, I, it's, I flew a Cessna 210 for a brief time, a long time ago, and don't remember that. I don't dispute that that's the way it is. It, it would be odd in my opinion. Many airplanes, including the uh, 1989 and later Bonanzas and Barons, uh, have all of the airplanes, all retractable gear airplanes will have some sort of gear warning system. And it's usually tied to, a, to the position of the throttle control such that if the throttle is near idle that uh, and the gear is not down the gear warning horn will sound and sometimes there's a, a sometimes there's a light that flashes as well in the uh, late 80s uh, beach airplanes were modified so that the same gear warning horn sounds if the flaps are selected to full down position and the uh, landing gear is not down it's wired through the squat switches and it, it can tell the position and the, and the gear actuator and can tell the position of the gear so I, at least in the beach airplanes, uh, it's an either or situation. There's nothing about the flat position that overrules the landing gear warning system uh, if the flaps are up. Uh, I suspect, and uh, just based on my own transition training into a beach duchess many, many years ago, uh, I suspect that uh, instead the Citation crew may have followed a sometimes routine, but I think ill-advised uh, technique of uh, pulling the landing gear warning circuit breaker when practicing single engine maneuvers, because otherwise you'll hear the gear warning horn going off the whole time. The throttle is on the uh, uh, simulated failed engine is in the idle position. I don't know if that's the case, but if I were an investigator, uh, I would look at the position of the landing gear warning circuit breaker in that airplane, uh, among other things. Now, see, that makes sense because they'd done a single engine approach before. I will tell you all in the Cessna 210, the gear warning horn is a little box above the right seat pilot, and it always breaks. Uh, any Cessna shop worth its merit will keep five or six of them in stock. And I will tell you, you must absolutely use the aircraft manufacturer's POH pre-flight checklist. There's so many people that just do a quick walk around or use these silly little checkmate checklist things. That's not legal. You got to use the aircraft POH. I can't tell you how many times people have hired me for a three-day mastery program. And then if you don't know, I'm, I'm rather pricey for a private three-day program. They'll fly me out there. I get there and I go, well, I can't fly the plane today because the gear warning horn doesn't work. They haven't checked it in years. And it's part of the manufacturer's POH. Or I had a guy fly me out to do a Cessna 310 course. And the stall warning horn didn't work. The pedo heat didn't work. He didn't know how to turn on the boots. I mean, you got to make sure all this stuff works. And I'll, it is very common in instructors to pull warning horns 
when they're annoying. So absolutely. Now we've got a lot of great questions. Um, uh, and, and some comments. So, uh, Brian, so this is what I do. Uh, I never take my hand off the gear switch until I see some version of greens or confirmations, right? Um, so Barry Schultz has a great question and I get this all the time and Barry, I'm sorry if I'm messing up the last name. What about if the guy behind you needs your extra speed, right? You're not at a 2,500 foot runway and United is coming up behind you. So if I'm going into a Bravo airport and let's say I'm landing at LAX or Boston or O'Hare, and I've landed on all of them in a GA airplane, and they say I need 150 knots till final, and I say un in in actual IMC, I say unable. My approach speed today is 110. However, if you need to take me off the approach and let the jet go in first, I'm happy to do that. That is just being a conscientious pilot. I'm not trying to hold up the airlines, but I'm not going to risk an accident either so it's their responsibility to space it out if they've got a jet come out behind me because the guy behind that didn't space them out i always always give them the option of taking me off the approach and vectoring me back in so i'm not doing it to be a jerk i'm just doing it to be safe so we'll get to many more questions later but the question is can ga pilots fly a high speed approach safely if ATC wants you to for sequencing? Well, I think we can be safer. I don't know if we can always be it perfectly safe, but I think we can be safer, but it's not just with a two pilot crew. It's a two pilot crew that's trained in cockpit resource management. Just two pilots is not the same as a cockpit crew. I think if we had very specific acceptance denial criteria, listen, if I'm practicing instrument approaches with a client and it's day VMC, calm winds, and they need 150 knots until final, you bet I'll get the gear up and move it, right? But not in actual IMC. So just have those ceiling visibility minimum set. If there's recurrent training in high speed approaches annual or every six months, you can't just do it on the fly and only, and this is just, again, my very strong opinion, only if you have a set pack profile for that. And fortunately, one of us does, Tom. <laughs> well, actually, we look at it a little bit differently uh, because uh, uh, we do have a set pack profile and teach a pack profile for a high speed approach. Uh, and it, uh, it's based on knowledge and use of the aircraft's uh, capabilities and limitations. And the, the idea here is if you have been trained on this and you practice it occasionally, I do this with people and it's, it's amazing how simple it is to do. Uh, much, it's much easier to demonstrate and practice than it is really to explain it. But uh, it, it's the, the basis is to have a pack that results in level flight just below your maximum gear extension speed, and then to know the pack that it takes to fly that precision approach glide path uh, profile, the, the 18 inches, 2,500 RPM approach flaps we talked about earlier. And so this is the way that we present it. Uh, if we're asked to, to fly a, well, and let me preface this also, if you are the least bit uncomfortable with the procedure, or if doing this is completely counter to your standard operating procedures that involve putting the landing gear down at five miles from the initial approach fix, then yes, you probably would be better off to decline it. And I, I like the idea of saying, um, I'm unable, can you give me a vector or even a speed reduction if necessary to let the preceding traffic pass, let them go first. But uh, you can do it this way, and we do it routinely in, in the, we teach it routinely in these airplanes, and, and I practice it occasionally. Um, it takes, in an A36 Bonanza, 
about 18 inches of manifold pressure to fly at 110 knots. With the gear down and approach flaps out, it will descend at that three degree profile. So it's that's what we are going to aim for later. If we have the gear up and we have the flaps up, then that same 18 inches of manifold pressure is going to cause the airplane to you know hold altitude. But if you increase manifold pressure by about four inches, as it turns out in these airplanes, where you come up to, in this case, 22 inches of manifold pressure, it will, in a clean configuration, it will fly level at about 150 knots. Now, in the later beach airplanes, the, the, gear, the maximum gear extension speed is 153 or 154 knots, depending on some calibration issues from one model to another. But it is a little bit more than 150 knots. Um, 150 knots is the approach profile of a mid-weight 737. So this is very compatible with, with uh, an airline arrival procedure. So you're at four inches greater than your your normal pack, you're at 22 inches manifold pressure, clean configuration, level inbound on the approach. You can do this in IMC. You fly this way in IMC all the time in level flight, higher up at even higher, uh, even faster speeds. So we're, we're coming on in inbound on the approach, intercepting the glide slope from below. When the glide slope indication indicates fly up one dot, your one you're one dot below the glide slope. This is when you begin to work. And this is the way we teach it to our pilots. Start with the landing gear because that creates the greatest amount of drag and work your way across the panel. Gear down. And as someone mentioned here, we teach exactly the same thing. Hang onto the gear handle until you've confirmed all the, uh, the noise, performance, and visual indications of gear extension. So gear down. Next, as you're going across the quadrant, bring the throttle back to 18 inches. Then next, put the uh, flaps to the approach position in these particular airplanes. You'd have to modify this for a different aircraft. Each one of these actions, extending the gear, reducing throttle, and adding uh, partial flaps, each one of those individually <clears throat> will cause the airplane to begin to descend in order to maintain its trimmed angle of attack, its trimmed airspeed. So what you need to do is apply gradual back pressure as you're doing this to maintain level flight, just enough back pressure to keep it level. It takes a little practice, but I, I get people to be able to do this easily after one demonstration all of the time. So now you're pulling back just a little bit to hold level flight as the airplane's decelerating and the glide slope needle is, needle is dropping in centers. When it centers, lower the nose to your normal attitude for final approach or glide slope approach, which is about two to three degrees below the horizon, just below the uh, horizon line. And the airplane is still in the process of decelerating. You're in a paradoxical situation here where you have to apply a little back pressure to get it to slow down, while at the same time, you're allowing the nose down just a little bit to maintain glide path. <clears throat> As it decelerates, you trim off the pressures, and after about two or 300 feet below glide slope intercept, the airplane is on speed, on configuration, on attitude, on glide slope, and it's as if you flew at 110 knots the whole way. Again, it sounds really complicated and looks a little busy on paper. I could take you up in the airplane and show it to you once and say, oh yeah, that's easy, I can do that. And it allows us to fly a 737 profile up to the point where we intercept the glide slope and then gradually decelerate going down glide path. Um, the Average speed from the final approach fix inbound to the uh, missed approach point, the average speed is, is going to be a little higher than a normal descent, but most of that descent you will be on your normal speed, trimmed up and everything, ready for a missed approach if you need it. Um, again, sounds complicated, but it works really easily, and we teach people to do this, so they've got this in their back pocket if they are asked to fly a high-speed approach. Great. Thanks, Tom. So mm -hmm. The thing I want to mention is I'm anti-high speed approach for mm -hmm. most pilots that fly single pilot IFR only because most really good pilots 
don't get to fly and train often enough to stay really proficient. If you can set a pack for a high speed approach very similar to this and you can train on this frequently enough i think it's great i think absolutely it's just all about consistency and training enough you can do any procedure with enough training um yeah. alan Weir had a great comment earlier when i was talking about you know telling atc enable hey alan and uh i've interacted with alan on other webinars before 91, 1, 2, 3. Well, if you accept an ATC clearance, are you allowed to deviate uh, unless it's an emergency? Well, no, but the trick is, is I wouldn't accept the clearance. If they say, I need 140 knots, and then you do, and then you start slowing down on your own, that's inappropriate. That's dangerous to other airplanes. That's a pilot deviation. If you say unable to accept that for safety, this is why, but you can take me off the approach, you can do something else with me, that's legal. But Alan's absolutely right. Don't accept a clearance and then start changing the plans without talking to ATC. That would be a really bad idea. So the yeah, I wanna, thing I wanna is jump real, in really fast. I wanna jump in really fast there because he's exactly right. Um, you need to be, if you are to accept an approach such as I've described, you need to be very clear with air traffic control what you can do. If they if they say, we need you to maintain maximum speed on the approach, or we want you to hold 160 or whatever, I would come back and say, I can maintain 150 knots to the glide slope intercept. And if that's adequate, do it. If they say, no, we need you to fly 170 knots to the runway threshold, I'm gonna decline that one too. Yeah, just just enable. And listen, if you all tune into live ATC, I my thing is the professionals say no all the time, right? My favorite thing is to listen to the airline crews when they get assigned to send via the arrival. More often than not, you'll hear a 737 crew say, well, I can give you the altitude or the speed, which one? Because they can't do both, right? Right. So if you can't accept a clearance, you just got to tell them. If you accept a clearance and then you don't do it, that is your fault. So really, the whole point of this webinar uh, that Tom and I threw together for y'all, and it's been so much better with everybody's participation, we're not done, is that you just got to be consistent. So what are the advantages to using PAC in single pilot IFR? Well, you can notice problems, whether you do Tom's method or mine. If you're using my method, and you're in a Mooney. I actually do most approaches in Moonies without flaps uh, because it just, I prefer 110 knots because the autopilots work a little better. If I'm flying a Mooney and the gear is down, the flaps are up and my manifold pressure set at this, I should be doing 110 knots. If I'm doing 95, did the flaps, come down did the speed brakes deploy do i have an engine problem uh if i set the power and i put the gear handle down but i'm doing 130 i i don't think the gear's actually down so by always using the same pack settings if you get a drastic change in performance well you'll notice a problem quicker also using the same pack settings really reduces decision fatigue. And decision fatigue really is the biggest cause of GA fatalities. The stall spin, the C fit, all the stuff that we've heard about really is an end result of decision fatigue. And we'll, my book has a lot more about that, but the short version is, is the more decisions you make, the more likely you are to get hurt if we can reduce the number of decisions by following a set procedure every time, you're much, much safer. And that reduces accidents. So boom, a quick bonus trip. So I actually have a very famous quote that I'm going to put up and I'm gonna ask the people online if they know who said it. My airplane lands better with full nose up trim. Does anybody out there know who, uh, who said it? Well, I'll just save you. Save you. It's it's every single pilot who's ever flown a Saratoga Cessna 206, 205, 
210. Every pilot has said that. I owned a Cessna 206 for many years, and I said that. Uh, I was flying with a really awesome pilot, a really great pilot, one of the best pilots I've trained in many, many years uh, in a Mooney uh, just a couple days ago. And he started to trim the nose up on landing, and he said, well, my airplane lands better with full nose up trim. I'm like, yeah, let's not do that. Um, and I'm just going to throw it over to Tom. If the airplane does land better with full nose up trim, it absolutely does. But if they trim all the way up, Tom, what happens if they do a go around? Well, that's that's the problem because again, an airplane's going to seek the uh, angle of attack for which it's trimmed. But really, what it's seeking is the amount of airflow over the elevator. And if you are trimmed very nose high, and then you apply full throttle, this will increase the amount of air flowing over the elevator. The aircraft thinks, if you will, that it's flying too uh, too fast, so it's going to pitch upward to try to slow down to the airspeed for which it's trimmed, and that's going to cause the airplane to reach a very high angle of attack. Uh, I was uh, kind of hinted uh, with Gary during the uh, practice for the show earlier today that the, the only time I've ever been dis deposed in an aircraft accident was several decades ago, and it was in this very situation. Uh, it was a turbocharged beach bonanza, and if you've flown a turbocharged bonanza, it's very much like the Saratogas and the 210s. Uh, both turbocharged and turbonormalized bonanzas are very nose-heavy airplanes. And so it's very common uh, in let the A36i fly, the normal takeoff trim position is three to six degrees up, but I'll be at about maybe nine to 12 degrees up if I trim for landing. And it can go much more nose up than that. But put a turbocharger on that same airframe and you'll end up at 21 degrees uh, up trim setting if you just simply trim off the pressures as you're coming into land. Well, that's what happened in the case that I was deposed in. Airplane took off, turbocharged Bonanza took off, a uh, very common situation uh, in Bonanzas is the forward cabin door pops open and the pilot did everything exactly right. Uh, you can't get it reclosed in flight. All you can do is come back in and land, secure it on the ground, take off again. And that's what he did. The problem is that he didn't run his before takeoff checklist again before the second takeoff. He failed to, to reset the trim to the safe three to six degree nose up uh, takeoff position and he took off with the with the uh, trim indicator in the 21 degree nose up. As soon as he applied power and raised the nose for liftoff, it over rotated, stalled and un unfortunate things happened. So uh, that's what will happen if you, if you have the tr nose trimmed too high. If you do fly an airplane like that Saratoga or 210 or a turbocharged Bonanza that is, has this characteristic of, uh, of very nose high trim, you have to be ready to push significantly forward on the controls uh, during the initial phase of a go around so that it will only come up, the nose will only come up to the proper attitude and it won't over rotate. Right, and I've seen all kinds of crazy compensations where people on the go around will go, well, I can only go at a little bit of power as I start trimming down. <laughs> like, well, yeah, but so, right, you just got to be really careful. And Eric Wiseman uh, nailed it. Is that essentially an elevator trim stall? A absolutely. It that is absolutely exactly is. that is exactly what the uh, airplane flying handbook calls an elevator trim stall. Uh, however, elevator trim stalls do not appear on any of the practical tests. So a lot of people don't get trained on that. and Nobody gets evaluated on it. All right, well, let's take a test. Uh, this is not a test of the participants. It's really more a test of, of uh, myself and Tom to make sure <laughs> we covered everything. So everybody, PAC stands for a pitch attitude configuration equals power needed, power attitude configuration equals pitch, power attitude configuration equals performance, or power attitude changes equals performance. And just using the questions feature, you can just answer or you can just yell at your computer and absolutely it is c power plus attitude plus configuration should give you a constant performance pack is usually applied by flight instructors only to go arounds flying traffic pattern any maneuvers when you are low and slow or 
all of the above. And you are correct, it's, it's all of the above. Cram, climb, clean is the safest way to teach go-arounds. Well, no, right? I think slowly adding power to get the nose up and truly adding power will bring the nose up as we all agree. Just doing everything much slower is, is much safer. Retracting the flaps as soon as you can in a go around. A, can cause the aircraft to sink instead of climb. B, should always be used. C, should be used only in mountainous terrain. Or D, should be used on high density altitude approaches. Well, it, it, it's A. It can actually cause the aircraft to sink instead of climb if you haven't accelerated to a certain speed. Yeah, absolutely. Trimming the nose up for landing. A, makes the landing easier for nose heavy airplanes. B, should only be done if you have electric trim. C, can cause unsafe nose high pitch up on go arounds or D, both A and C. And the answer is yes, both A and C. It certainly does make it easier, I will agree. When choosing your airspeed flap setting for instrument approach, uh, it's important to consider A, climb rates in go rounds and missed approaches, B, your autopilot limitations, C, the stability of the approach, or D, all of the above. And of course, you're all going to say all of the above. Mm -hmm. If ATC tells you to maintain an approach 30 knots faster than your normal in actual IMC until the final approach, you should A, do it, they need it for spacing. B, ask why they need it, need it. C, just blanket unable, or D, say unable for safety and add what speed you can do. Well, I think you should do D. When would it be safer to do a high-speed approach? A, in VMC. B, if you're flying as part of a two-pilot crew trained in CRM. C, if you've done more training with a specific second pack for high-speed instrument approach procedures, or D, all of the above. And of course, we're going to select D. Using the same pack and performance speed for every approach, and we're gonna select all that apply. A, doesn't work if you're at a busy Bravo airport. B, helps identify problems. C, isn't needed if you're good enough to adapt. Or D, is safer and prevents accidents. Well, if you're good enough to fly for the military, and if you're good enough to fly for the airlines, then you're good enough to fly GA, and you'll know the answers are B and C. And we've gotten a lot of great questions and comments, and we do have a few minutes at the end, so we haven't forgotten them. So my question is, how committed are you to making a change in general aviation? If you're committed to partnering with the guy in the pink shirt and pilotsafety.org to reduce GA accidents, one, we'd like to share this, we'd like you to share this information with others. And we're going to show you how you can actually share this video. We'd like you to get active in professional development groups. We'd like you to sign up for more webinars. And you should get some mastery, not minimums training. And there's some other stuff. So share this course with others. You can post this on Facebook. You can talk about it to other instructors. You can share pieces with other pilots. How about getting involved? You can join the FA safety team. You do not have to be a flight instructor to be an active rep. One of the people that did more for GA safety than anybody I've ever known was a private pilot who never even had an instrument rating. They just wanted to keep little airplanes from crashing on public TV. So you just go over to fasafety.gov, you click on resources, you click on about the FAST team, and you click join the FAST team. It's real, real simple. You can sign up for more webinars both on fasafety.gov and of course, pilotsafety.org. We always have free webinars. How about joining some other groups? Like, I don't know, how about the American Bonanza Society? And there are lots of other groups. There's a Piper Flyers Association and a Cessna Flyers Association and a Cessna Twin and a Piper. There's all kinds of other groups, right? Now, how do you share this information with others? Well, one of the things you all could download besides a handout 
with a list of all these links is you can also download this picture. And we'd love for you to take this picture and post it on Facebook and TikTok and Instagram and Twitter and all the other wonderful social media programs and tell people that you like the program and you think they should do it. Now, if you'd like to invest in your education and further your information, uh, further your education, well, mastery comes from, well, I don't know, there's Tom's site. Um, and mastery-flight-training.com, that's actually Tom Turner's site. Go there and sign up to get those flying lessons weekly. It's I get so many newsletters and magazines, and I got to tell you, it's the one I go out of my way to read. A lot, yeah, I just don't have time, and I'll read them occasionally. It's a great weekly newsletter. There's so much stuff there, and you can work with Tom, and there's so many cool free publications and tools. Tom, do you want to say anything about what you can find there? Uh, well, um the tools for flying safely uh, section page has a number of links. I do the Beechcraft weekly accident update that tracks trends in accidents in piston beach airplanes. Uh, but my primary uh, product is the weekly uh, flying lessons weekly email or email blast. It's, it's free. You can also find it in PDF form on the site and I have an archive that you can look at back issues. Uh, but it's uh, sign up and uh, take a look. It comes out usually late Wednesday nights US Central Time and uh, I'd like to have you uh, include your comments. I get a lot of uh, great reader feedback that we include in the weekly reports. Good. Uh, if you'd like to read more about adrenaline paralysis and decision fatigue, and slowing down and packing uh, with some specific packed sheets. Uh, there's my book, which you can get at pilotsafety.org, and my video training on Avidyne for Flight Garmin. Again, you're probably already good when stuff's normal. If you want to be great when things go wrong, uh, you could watch our mastery versions. Uh, just make sure you use the coupon code PACK to get uh, 20%. So we have plenty of time for questions. I do want to acknowledge a comment. Um, somebody said it's a shame that this was uh, this webinar was uh, not advertised as uh, so bonanza centric uh, that it didn't apply to me because I fly a Cessna. You know, I'm really sorry if it came across that way. I actually invited Tom on here because that's how I learned about PAC. And if we didn't say it enough, these techniques work on every airplane. I just brought Tom on because he inspired me and he had very specific examples, yeah. but I use these on every type of plane. They're yeah. not just for Banzas. Yeah, um, one of my coworkers uh, purchased a Cessna 172 to finish his uh, private pilot certificate in several years ago. It was an older, uh, it was a 1962 model. And the first thing I did before, when he bought that airplane, before I even flew with him, is I took it up for half an hour and I figured what it took for it to fly in level flight at 90 miles per hour, which made sense in that airplane. So I could figure out a pack for traffic patterns, via visual traffic patterns. And I found in that airplane, uh, the power setting it included carburetor heat and the first notch of flaps. And we have we developed a, a pack. Now, yeah, Gary asked me to be here and uh, asked me to, or offered for me to uh, let me use some of the slides we teach in our program. But uh, uh, yeah, this uh, the, the concept is valid in any type of airplane. If you were to go out in your aircraft and establish level flight at the speed that your airplane would climb out at, at your airplane's climb speed. If you establish level flight at your airplane's climb speed and trim off the pressures, note what the power setting is. And that now is your pack for flying a visual pattern or flying an instrument approach. You might decide, okay, well, I want a little flap for more stability, so I'm gonna put out some flap, and that means I'm going to uh, need to change the power a little bit 
uh, you can do that, but you, you can easily figure out the packs for your airplane if you're not in a type club that has already figured this out for you. But yeah, I apologize if it got a little bit off in the bonanza weeds uh, because we were using my slides on this. Yeah, I you know, it's, it's totally my fault. I, I should have said that much more often. All right, so uh, time for a few questions. Uh, Chris Denny had a question uh, a while ago. Chris said, how long would you use your autopilot and IFR conditions when flying an approach? And when should you just plan on him flying it? So Chris, I'm going to take this. Uh, I am a firm believer if you own a dog, you should never stand outside and bark for yourself. I never want anybody to hemp fly anything. If you have an autopilot, it should be on 100% of the time that it's legally allowed to be on because it reduces decision fatigue. It takes all of the work out of it. So most uh, modern autopilots uh, are allowed at 800 feet after takeoff and allowed down to 200 feet decision altitude in most GA airplanes. And I would let it do it the entire time. Couple caveats to that. One, you must understand every single function of the autopilot. You must do the required self-test before every flight. Most people have never read the supplement and they aren't doing the required self-test uh, before every single flight. Three, you must know how to kill it when it misbehaves and you never give it a second chance. And I'm a firm believer in you only fly GPS. I would never do an ILS if GPS is working because LPV is much more stable. I would never fly, I would never hand fly anything if I have an autopilot because it reduces decision fatigues and it's much safer. That all being said, at least once a month, I would like everybody listening to file a flight plan to a VOR, tracking a Victor Airway to another VOR, do a VOR approach that involves a procedure turn and circling to land with no flight plan in your GPS without turning on for flight and doing the entire thing with raw data and a timer. Because as much as I want you to use autopilots and as much as I want you to, hey, I'm the guy in the pink shirt, I want you on the pink line, you must maintain your ability to hand fly and do raw data approaches when things go wrong. So if you have an autopilot and you know how it works, you know how to kill it, you've done the required self-test and you maintain hand flying skills, then I would always use it. So that's a long-winded way of saying always, but make sure you know how to kill it if it misbehaves. Um, Chuck, if you missed the first half, well, that's easy, buddy. You're going to get an email with a link to rewatch this and share it uh, with others. Constantine, I wish there was something similar for slower planes with fixed gear. Well, this absolutely applies. And Tom and I were just talking. I will tell you, uh, in anything 160, 180 horsepower, my standard approach is flaps 10, 85 knots. Uh, usually 2150 RPM holds you at 85 knots. So, but the way you do this, as Tom was saying, is you go out and you experiment and you come up with your own pack sheets. And in the handout is a copy of a pack sheet that you can use for that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Tom, this one I gotta give to you. Harry okay. Schultz. Is it true that the wing profile of a Bonanza is the same as a P-51? It's roughly the same physical shape. The laminar flow design is very different. In other words, the cross section is very different, but the plan view, I saw this in somebody's magazine just recently or online somewhere that showed uh, superimposed a P-51 wing shape over a Bonanza shape. Uh, you know, it's got a, a more or less fixed uh, leading edge with a notch toward the fuselage and a tapering trailing edge. Uh, so they are somewhat similar in their uh, plan view, but uh, it's not the same airfoil. Okay. Well, it's uh, 844, so we're about 15 minutes. I'm just seeing tons of people saying great job, and we certainly appreciate mm -hmm. it. If we didn't get to your question, you can always reach out at either one of our websites. Yeah. Pilotsafety.org yeah. or 
mastery-flight-training.com. And we'll or get back just to you. email me at tom at bonanza.org. That'll, that'll get me too. Great. And uh, Wings Credit, for those of you watching live, uh, will happen probably tomorrow afternoon. So thanks. You'll get an email within just a couple hours on how to watch a replay and share it with others. Thank you, everybody, for being here. We had well over a thousand. Tom, thank you, my friend. Thanks for being thanks. part of us. Thanks for asking, Gary. All right. Well, we will see you all soon. And in the meantime, uh, everybody uh, go buy a Bonanza and get a bright pink shirt. <laughs>